Welcome back to the Bible verse by verse, and we have reached the end of Genesis. In the previous video, we saw how Joseph spent his time in Egypt between being sold into slavery and meeting his family once more. The story of how he rose to become Prime Minister of Egypt is well known, as is the story of his reuniting with his brothers. Rather than dryly reading through a story you all know well, I want to pick out a couple of points. After the fun and games, when Joseph finally reveals himself to his very slow on the uptake brothers, he tells them very clearly and emphatically, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Just in case any of you were in any doubt as to who was responsible for the torment and suffering which both Joseph and Jacob had suffered. But why was Joseph so sure of this? It's only when I read the Joseph story again that I realized something significant. Joseph never speaks to God, and God never speaks to Joseph. If there is one thing we know about the patriarchs, it is that they are constantly chatting to God. In the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God is continually popping in. At the end of Genesis, Jacob is still in regular contact with God. In the next chapter, Moses will have God on speed dial, yet in the full 13 chapters of Genesis dedicated to the Joseph story, not once does God appear to talk to this patriarch. Also, Joseph in the Bible does not come across as the poor little boy who was rejected by his brothers and eventually made good. He fell foul of his brothers because he told them that they would bow down to him. When they arrived in Egypt, he kept up a pretense which ensured that they did just that. Joseph's actions are of someone who is boastful and selfish. When he finally reveals himself to his brothers, he tells them that God hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Meanwhile Jacob, the one who beat God at naked man wrestling, and who was transformed into the eponymous Israel for his actions, has had to suffer the anguish of believing his son Joseph is dead, and has anguish further heaped on him by Joseph's actions. Joseph has Simeon bound and sends his other brothers back to Jacob demanding that Benjamin be brought to him. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin, if I be bereaved of my children. I am bereaved. Now supposedly Joseph's torture of his brothers and his father is all a test to see whether his brothers have mended their ways. Why he needs to torture his father is not clear, or indeed why someone who supposedly knows the future knows what God has planned and clearly states that the whole enterprise was God's doing and not the brothers needs to torture anyone at all is not made clear. It all smacks of the cognitive dissonance which believers need to maintain their belief, much like believing that God has to test Abraham's faith by commanding him to kill Isaac, because God would need to test someone's faith because, well, of course, he wouldn't. But eventually, everyone is smiling, and Jacob relocates to Goshen at Joseph's invitation. We are told that all the souls that came with Jacob into Egypt, which came out of his loins, Besides Jacob's son's wives, all the souls were three score and six. Of course, being the Bible, all the souls means all the males, women being considered as worthy of counting as the cattle, and slaves slightly less. So they all settle in Goshen to be near Joseph, which tells us something. Goshen is in the eastern Nile Delta. Egypt is almost synonymous with the Nile 
it is today and always has been, in an inhospitable desert it is the Nile which gives life and the Nile which civilization has clung to. We can see that this meant that settlements were limited to the fertile banks of the river and the delta. We also need to remember that the pharaohs of unified Egypt were rulers of upper and lower Egypt, and wore the double crown to show this. This lone fact indicates that they felt the need to impress upon their world that they were rulers of two discrete areas. Throughout Egyptian history there was conflict between the two Egypts. Theban Upper Egypt did not always enjoy sovereignty or even suzerainty over the Nile Delta Lower region of Egypt. The Egyptian Second Intermediate Period was a period of instability. A lot of detail is missing about this period because the pharaohs who followed were not great ones for documenting the failures of the ruling class, and all the pharaohs were ones for erasing those bits of history which they found inconvenient. What we can be fairly confident about is that Egypt was going through a period of turmoil which lasted several centuries. The Second Intermediate Period, 1802 to 1550 BCE, is a period of disarray between the end of the Middle Kingdom and the start of the New Kingdom. It is best known as the period when the Hyksos made their appearance in Egypt. There are likely to be many contributing factors to the turmoil, including population migrations, battles for control of trade routes, and the general bolshiness of local rulers. There is also clear evidence of a climactic event centred around 1627 BCE, which shows up in tree ring chronologies and ice core data. This last I mention as it would have resulted in significant crop failures and famine, which might have been reported in stories of the time we have had famine stories already in the Bible. Immediately Abram arrived in the Promised Land, there was a famine which forced him to sojourn in Egypt. Isaac then experienced a famine, but only travels to Gerar rather than Egypt. The difference here is that Jacob does not travel to Egypt, but sends his sons to fetch corn. This is a little odd. If you are in a famine situation, you move to where the food is. When your family and livestock are facing starvation, you do not send people on a lengthy journey in search of food, you go to the food, or at least I would. But there might be more here, and that brings me back to the Hyksos. What we know about the Hyksos is fragmentary, enigmatic, and sometimes contradictory. It is reasonable to say that around 1800 BCE, peoples moved into the Nile Delta from Canaan, or perhaps further east. Early Egyptian records suggest that the Hyksos violently overran Lower Egypt, but the archaeology does not appear to support this, and it may be revisionist history on the part of later pharaohs. We do know that the Hyksos appear to have introduced new military technology to the area, including chariots. We also know that Egyptian dynasties were losing control and stability, possibly due to climatic upheavals resulting in drought and famine. Whether the Hyksos initially settled peacefully and then became a local power, or arrived as invaders, they eventually ruled as pharaohs in Lower Egypt, whilst the Egyptians ruled in Upper Egypt. And for a short time, the Hyksos ruled all of Egypt, or at least exerted suzerainty over it. Eventually the Hyksos were kicked out of Egypt by Amos I, some time around the 1520s BCE. So the Hyksos would appear to have been present in Egypt for around 300 years at least. And though they are thought to have originated in Canaan, the Hyksos certainly went native while in Egypt. They styled themselves as pharaohs, gave themselves Egyptian throne names, had their own cartouches and seals, built or reused existing Egyptian monuments, and worshipped Egyptian gods. As mentioned in the previous video, Potiphar's wife's attempted seduction of Joseph has parallels in the ancient Egyptian tale of two brothers. It is in the Ramesside dream book that we find the pit or well Joseph was cast into by his brothers revealed as a dream omen which foretells that the dreamer will end up in prison, as of course Joseph eventually does. Pharaoh elevates an imprisoned enslaved troglodyte to a position of power where he controls the whole country. In an isolationist Egypt where the pharaohs consider themselves gods, and where all other races were considered inferior, was this really likely to have happened, unless the pharaoh in question was himself not an Egyptian. After revealing the meaning of pharaoh's dreams, Joseph is given the Egyptian name Zapnath Paner. The King James does not translate this name. When Joseph is paraded through the streets, 
in the second chariot which he had, and they cried before him, Bow the knee. The authors of the King James have translated the word abrek to mean bow the knee. But abrek is an Egyptian word, and we do not have a translation for it. Joseph married an Egyptian, which is surprising after all the efforts his antecedents went through to ensure that they kept the Hebrew line pure. When Joseph died, he is embalmed, not just embalmed, but mummified and buried in Egypt. There is only one other embalming carried out in the Bible, that of Jacob, Joseph's father. In the detail provided for Jacob's embalming, you can read the 40 days of dehydration in Natron and the 70 days total of the mummification process. You can get little more Egyptian than being mummified upon death. All of this makes the Joseph story a very Egyptian one, but more than that, it would appear to make Joseph more Egyptian than Hebrew. And there might well be an explanation for that. According to Usher's chronology, and the one adhered to by many Bible literalists, Joseph became Prime Minister around 1884 BCE, and the Exodus began around 1445 BCE, with the Israelites' time in Egypt being 440 years. Of course, under this chronology and storyline, the Israelites are Jacob's sons and their offspring. It is the twelve sons, including Joseph, who produced the two million offspring who would enter the wilderness 440 years later. Historically, we know that the Hyksos were ejected from Egypt back into Canaan, and the Bible gives us the story of Joshua conquering the land of Canaan and allocating it to the twelve tribes. For the descendants of the people who conquered Canaan to claim legitimacy in the land they had invaded, they would need to be able to tie themselves back to the covenant Yahweh made with Abraham and provide an explanation for why a bunch of Egyptians were really Hebrews and entitled to the land. 400 years is a long time. If the original European settlers of the USA decided to arrive back in their ancestral countries and claim a legitimate right to land, they would need to come up with a pretty good excuse for that claim. Or, if a bunch of Jews, whose families had spent 2,000 years living in Europe and elsewhere, wanted to claim that they had a legitimate claim to land in the Middle East, they too would have to come up with a pretty good excuse. Hmm. Thank you, as always, for watching. Thank <music> you.